What's up, y'all? Episode 88. We doing it business news and other shit. We had Danielle Pierce on this episode. Who? Yo, this is a wealth strategist for real estate. She's a real estate wealth strategist. Check her out, DanielPierce.com. We taped again from Cedars, the restaurant I've been running here, y'all. New menu is slapping. Come through, roll through. We got some cool stuff. Middle Eastern fried chicken, Middle Eastern fish and chips. That's right. I'm totally pitching this restaurant. Come through, y'all. You all going to love it. Say what's up to me if you see me. Um... DanielPierce.com. Yo, she's cool. She's like, yo, you don't need to just be a real estate broker to make money in real estate. There's other ways. And she broke down to us how to make money becoming a repair and maintenance person for foreclosed properties. She basically works from her computer anywhere she wants to by hiring contractors to go fix houses for banks that have foreclosed on houses. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, make sure you listen because we go into detail and explain it. She also talked about making money through tax liens. Um, and how she basically will buy properties, scoop properties up on the cheap for a thousand or two thousand dollars, and then tr- later on sell them for double or triple, uh, if not even more. Um, the hardest part about all this: dealing with contractors. That's what she said. Dealing with contractors is the hardest part about all this. Um, so she's figured out some tricks and secrets. She's been doing this for almost ten years. I think she said like seven or eight years. So she was super cool, super smart woman. Uh, she's based out of Texas now, but she basically does this kind of coaching, right? She she she's a coach for wealth for wealth strategy when it comes to real estate. So she's gonna walk you through step by step through an eight week course she runs um, to become a person who makes good cash managing contractors for repair and maintenance for foreclosed house, or she'll coach you also on being a, a tax lien investor where you can simply use $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 to buy a property that has been delinquent on its taxes that the government owns now. And man, did she have some crazy stories about contractors and tax lien stories. The best, one house became like the house in Frozen, y'all. Someone decided to turn all the faucets on, plug up the holes in the house, and freeze the house in the dead of winter because they were not happy they were being evicted. Um, So she had to go in there and melt all that, thaw all that, and we heard some other crazy stories, too. Anyway, you're going to learn a ton about how she does this, how she makes her cash. You could do it, too. I'm not even kidding. This is a legit way of becoming a real estate person. Uh, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode, y'all. Peace. All right, so Danielle Pierce, what's up? Thank you for joining us. It's cool to have you on this podcast. Just so you know, Danielle, we we like to just chat it up, tell stories, uh, you know, share some insight, teach each other some shit, you know, uh, whatever, whatever's clever. You know, we like to just have a good time. Um, so thank you for joining us. Really cool of you to join us. Problem. Thank you. I saw the name and I was just like, oh my God, this is like the best name of a podcast ever. What? You like it? Oh, you like I it? I love it. I Man, love it. my whole background, my whole life has been business related. I grew up in this restaurant and grocery store with my pops. I then went to Wall Street, worked as an investment banker for a long time, 10 years. And then I'm right back. I'm doing now stand up comedy and other types of comedy and this podcast and trying to make a business out of that. And then I own this restaurant now. So that's kind of the entertainment business. I'm figuring that out. And so, like, I'm like, yo, I guess I could talk business. I'm really comfortable talking business, but I also like to talk about other shit. So I'm like, all right, right. business news and other shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I love it. So is comedy your thing? Is that like your first love? And then, yeah, I'm just, what's it's, the, what's it's the a pa- It's a big passion of mine. Yeah. Okay. But it wasn't, it wasn't like my, I would say, I don't know. It's a good question. Like what my first love is. My first yeah. love is probably my mom. That's, that's if you want to be for real. To this day, I love my mom. Oh, man, I don't know what I'd do without my mom. Um, so, yeah, that's probably my first love. Uh, but, like, I've always thought, like, since I was a kid, man, I'd love to be an actor. You know, I always saw myself, like, on TV or in a movie or something like that. But everyone in my family would be like, you know, like, back in those days, people didn't really, I don't know. I'm Muslim. I grew up Muslim. And I'm Muslim. And I'm Arab, too. So everyone would be like, because they didn't know what was going on in America and like th- the new world, you know, that everyone moved to from the Middle East, everything they would say is like, no, that's against our religion. That's against our religion. And everything was against, if, like, if they didn't know what to say about it, that's against our religion. I'm like, acting is against our religion. Yeah. <laughs> don't you see them doing sex scenes sometimes? I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. That's, you know, I guess that's probably against our religion, but come on now. Like, can't I do any non sex scenes? Right. So I would say that might have been one of my... What, what's up, John? 
No, it's just sex scenes are okay, but it just has to be like a hundred percent sex scenes. That's only all. sex scenes. Yeah, only sex That's scenes. That's all you're allowed yeah, to do. Yeah. That's only that would be in line with our religion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh so uh so I don't know, yeah, maybe my acting is my first love, I might say. Um and then I went to acting school and I th- now I'm doing all this comedy stuff. Uh, cause I had some dear, dear friends, um, who were comedians and I went on tour with them quite a bit and I just learned about them, got close with them. And I'm like, yo, I, this is amazing. You know? And so that's kind of what, uh, I dove in head first, you know, changed my life from the world of investment banking more towards the world of entertainment. So yeah, I, yeah. big shift. Yeah, that's pretty dope. So investment banking, did it like, was it, is, is it as stressful as people say? Yes. In terms Ab- of the work? Abs- yeah, absolutely. It, it, for me, I was not on the corporate finance side. So I wasn't actually putting pitch decks together and presentations and trying to tell, you know, um, um, AOL to merge with Time Warner or like, you know, uh, Apple to merge with Google. I wasn't doing any of that stuff. Um, I was more on the trading floor and I was specifically a salesperson. So my job was to talk to clients, trade with clients, whether it's bonds or derivatives or, you know, any sort of money they wanted to borrow or lend or invest. I would help do that. Uh, on the trading floor, but like you're so plugged into the market, expectations are so high, they're ready to fire and cut anyone that isn't producing many millions of dollars of profit. Um, And so, yeah, that's what made it intense was the expectations. Truth be told, no one's life was in my hands. So my guess is a doctor or a surgeon probably has even more pressure and stress, um, but in a different way. Hmm. That is one hell of a background and it's definitely... I don't think mine is nowhere near as interesting. (laughs) I don't know. I mean, you're a 10 year full time entrepreneur. Tell me that ain't interesting. I am. I am. Especially for a woman. I mean, I'm just going to be real. A black woman. I'm Uh just trying to tell you now. Chips are stacked against you, Danielle. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So the fact that you're doing this um, is an achievement, huge achievement in, in America in 2020. Yeah, I guess I never really spent a lot of time thinking about it that way. My initial plan was to, I always got good grades in school because it was easy. I was like, oh, it's boring. I just, you know, it's, it's, it, I always was a really strong student. Mm. And so I went to U of I, oddly enough, on a caddy scholarship because I was a caddy. Get out of here. A golf caddy? Old. Yes. That's cool. Yes, yes, wait, wait, wait. There's yes. such a thing as a golf caddy scholarship? I thought like golf scholarship. Yeah. No, it's called the Chick Evans Caddy Scholarship. It still, it still exists. Dude. And so that's how I ended up going to U of I. And it covers tuition and housing. So basically, you don't really have a lot to pay for once Good you get for the you. scholarship. Yeah. So I made that happen. And I have an accounting degree. And so the only reason I have an accounting degree is because the only other person that went to college in my family has an accounting degree. And I was like, oh, shit, that'd be cool. Let me major in accounting. And it was so boring and so awful. I was like, this super sucks. But they would always tell us things like, oh, it's going to be exciting once you start working. You're going to love it. You're going to lying be through their teeth every day. Lying and through I was like, teeth. all right, I'll give it a shot. And so I got my first job and yeah, it definitely sucked. <laughs> where, where was your first job? Like KPMG or somewhere? It was not. I actually worked at American Express Tax and Business Services. It was yep. around the time that Amex had bought a public accounting firm and they were getting into, you know, that arena. So I started working there. It's one South Walker Drive, downtown yep. Chicago. And I thought I was freaking when, when was this? This was 2002 is when I started. November 2002. Yo, I had a friend who worked there named Sultan. Does that name ring a bell at all? It does ring a bell. Yo, uh, d- I forget yeah. his last name now. Um, yeah. n- n- nicest guy in the world, right? Uh, um, but like now, when I check out his Facebook and stuff... This guy's gotten in some serious hot water. Have you kept up with Sultan at all? I have not. Well, I, I didn't know he was in hot water. That he, st- he stayed an accountant like you. Uh, um, oh, sorry, sorry. Unlike you, he stayed an accountant. Uh-huh. But this dude went on to be like a personal accountant for a high net worth individual. Um, and, and apparently, apparently, okay, allegedly, all right, the, the, the rich guy who was his boss claimed that Sultan was buying many houses, like 25 homes, real estate property, boats, expensive cars, all sorts of stuff with the, with the rich dude's money, but Sultan was owning it somehow. So Sultan mm-hmm. was supposedly embezzling money in some way and 
and using it to buy property and other types of things. And so now they're in, you know, not, so he got arrested and all that other stuff. I don't know what's going wow. on with him. I presume he's defending himself. If he's innocent, he obviously is defending himself. And if yeah. he's guilty, I don't know what, what he's doing. You know, he's trying to figure out his life. Um, but wow. sometimes an accountant degree can get so boring that you do some crazy ass shit like that. <laughs> Or, or you're overworked, right? If you're in public accounting, you're overworked and you're underpaid. Mm. And so maybe that's what people start to feel entitled to other people's money. I don't know. But I just know it was super boring and it sucked. And it was weird because I worked with a bunch of people who had been at the, uh, in accounting for years, like 20, 30, 35 years. And they all hated it too. But then they kept coming every day and every year. And, and I was just like, Oh, it was awful. So I knew I wasn't going to last there. And I lasted five years exactly. Wow. Uh, they started doing layoffs. This is when I was I switched over from there to Sam Zell's company at the time, Equity Office. Oh, cool. And um, they started laying off the laying off the audit department. I was like, oh, I want to get laid off. I'm, I hate this job. I want to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to be rich. No, wait, this is that you're, you're hoping to get laid off at American Express, right? No, no, no. I switched. I had left. I was at MX for like, I think for three years. And then I went to Equity Office. I was there for almost three years as well. And you were hoping Equity Office would lay you off. Yes. Got and they it. did. Wow. And then it was like, oh, shit, I got what I asked for. And then <laughs> I wasn't even ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they ended up um, cashing out all of our stock when they let us go. And at mm. the time, it was like I had like thirty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. And of course, I'm broke. I've you know, never had money in my life. And so I see $30,000. I'm like, I'm rich. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Oops. And so then I spent all that money. Yeah, so all that money, kicking it, partying, going to concerts, going on vacation. <laughs> and um, yeah, well, yeah you were burned out. You had to recover. Well, kind of. I was also very ignorant, too, as well. And then uh, I just thought being an entrepreneur just meant doing stuff like this all day. Just hanging out, <laughs> kicking it, partying, you know. Yeah, I made that <laughs> same mistake, money. too. <laughs> so, yeah, it was rough for a while. Mm. All right, yeah. cool. Well, cool. It's great to have you on. So, I mean... I'm checking out your like I'm checking out your uh uh um background and I was like, yo, you're a wealth strategist, but specifically for real estate. And I was like, what? What's that mean? I don't even know. So um um and then you said without selling anything, yeah. you can you can you can basically help people succeed in real estate. What I understood that to mean was you don't need to be a sales broker. You don't need to be a, a sales agent to to you make don't. money in real estate. Is that what you meant? Yes, that's exactly what I meant. Okay. Because people always think real estate that they're going to um, that you have to be an agent or people will say things like, oh, I want to get in real estate. I'm going to get my real estate license. I'm like, well, you know, those things are unrelated. Um, right. Getting a real estate license just allows you to represent buyers and sellers. And you don't actually learn a whole lot about real estate. Like as far as investing and flipping and tax liens and things like that, you're not taught any of that stuff when you get your license. You just mm. get the certificate. And so I tell people that, you know, you can make money in a bunch of different ways. So I do. I'm a tax lien investor. And then I also um, do the repairs and maintenance for foreclosed properties in different parts around the country. All right. So, so let's, let, me, let me go slow. Let me go slow. Yeah. So you're a tax lien investor. Invest. We'll get yes. we'll get into that in a little bit. But then okay. you also do repairs and maintenance to foreclosed properties, properties that are already foreclosed and no one really cares about. You do yeah. repairs and maintenance to those with the intention of doing something, I presume. Um, no, that's the only intention is to do repairs and maintenance. And oh, I okay. You get paid for that by, by banks or whoever you yeah. get paid for that. The banks pay us. My team does it because I can't, I'm not actually handy with anything other than, <laughs> I don't know, taking pictures with my cell phone. Um, but it's very specialized. I've been doing it for, you know, the last six, seven years or so. And it works for me. You know, you make much decent money and it's not heavily, a lot of client interaction. It's not a lot of taking strangers around in your car to go look at properties and blah, 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 or trying to talk people out of why you can't show them a house in Beverly. That's, I don't know, $800,000 when they are approved for like one fifty. Mm-hmm. So you avoid, I avoided all of that, which is what I wanted to do. So mm-hmm. I'm happy. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Avoid, avoid, avoid basically, basically being a salesperson. That wasn't yeah. your cup of tea. Yeah. I got it. And so you figured out ways to make money in real estate without having to sell. I got you. Yeah. Cool. And so now you you actually will, will you actually coach people on this as well? I do. I've coached right. lots and lots and lots of people. They've had um, amazing success stories as well. It's one thing to be able to do something yourself, but it's another thing people can duplicate your results too. So it's it's so cool to see that people are like, oh shit, this actually worked. You know, I, I, I paid for this training and it works because a lot of stuff online, you know, 
I mean, a lot of it is great. A lot of it's not so great. All right. So, so give us like the one you're most proud of, the amazing story you're most proud of that you're like, oh, snap. I didn't even know I can coach them to do that. They're doing better than me. How the hell are they doing better than me? Wait, this is not supposed to be happening like this. What the? Uh, so there's a few. So on the. But the big one, coach, the big whale, the big, the big one, um, I helped a couple. They're actually in Chicago market and they got started and, you know, working with the foreclosed properties uh, about three years ago. And within their second year, they had made two hundred and forty eight thousand dollars for that year. Whoa, so that was pretty dope. That's and oddly great. enough, the husband was actually an auditor. So he was still in audit. So he was working in the same field that I was. And so to see him go from, you know, he's making pretty decent money. Sure. I'm sure. But to see him go from that to basically like double, it was like, that was, that was dope. Wow. Wait, wait. So uh, uh, how, how did they do this? So, so they called you up and said, yo, can you give us some advice? We're thinking of dipping our toe in the water. What did you tell them? Yes. I said, yes, let's do it. All right. And what you, <laughs> so how did you coach them? What did you tell them to do? What was like um, step one, step two, step three? Step one, step two, step three. So step one is, okay, f- first of all, let's figure out why you want to do this and do you have the time to do it. Oh, um, that's Next smart. step is you have to set up an, an actual business because it's not as if you can just be a, a, you know, hang your hammer out and say, hey, I'm ready to go work on these properties. Yep. You have to have an official structure to do that. Like an LLC that's, or something, right? Yeah, yeah LLC, uh, C Corp, S Corp, whatever sure. makes the most sense. Set up the business, get the proper insurance in place. You got to have a background check because you can't have a criminal record be working on these properties as well. So you get all that stuff taken care of. And then from there, it's a matter of applying with the different companies around the country to get a contract to cover a specific territory. And then once you get the contract, you have to manage it. And basically, that means just hiring the right people, um, overseeing the work as it's being done, reviewing the work orders, paying your team, things like that. OK, so wait, wait. Let me bit. let me slow you down, Danielle, because there's a lot of good, chunky stuff you're saying here. <laughs> so so you didn't tell them right away go look at listings and go buy this foreclosed property. No, you first said to them, first of all, do you all have the time? Second of all, set up an LLC and call your company, you know, repairs and maintenance foreclosure LLC or something like that. So you got them first into the repair and maintenance business, not yet into buying and selling and flipping and investing, right? Right. Yeah. We don't get, we don't get that far into, we just only do the repair and maintenance. Gotcha. And it's actually very, very, um, it's very, very lucrative. And a lot of people are like, oh, I didn't know this was a thing. I'm like, yeah, it is a thing because mm. somebody has to do the work on these properties. And so the neighbors for sure appreciate it. OK, so when you ask them about like timing, like, do you have the time for this? Like people are listening right now to this podcast, not literally right now, because we're probably going to publish in a couple of days. But yeah. um, people are listening to like, yo, can I do that? So like, like um, what is the commitment in your experience for someone to jump into the world of repairing and maintaining, maintaining foreclosed homes? Um, so I, I think it's better if you are doing it full time and you don't have a traditional nine to five. However, if you do have a nine to five already, your job has to have some level of flexibility involved mm. in it, meaning you have to be able to respond to an email or a text here and there. I think it's ideal to have a partner that is uh, much more flexible than you. So, for example, in the couple in Chicago, He worked in audit full time, but she was an entrepreneur and kind of I'm not going to say she had free time like entrepreneurs don't do shit all day. But Mm. she had more um, flexibility in her schedule. So she was able to do more of the admin stuff that he didn't have time to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I still think even aside from that, you still have to be willing to put in work after you get off work. And that's mm-hmm. where most people kind of start mm-hmm. shying away from like, uh, I want to make money, but I mean, I don't want to do all of that to make money. Got and you. There's a catch 22. So this couple were like, okay, I, we'll, we'll split up some of the work between husband and wife yes. and we'll do this. Yes, absolutely. And, and what, like, how many hours a week would you guesstimate? Or is it too hard to think about it that way? Do you think about it more in terms of like email and text communication? I think uh, so. I like I don't think about things in hours anymore just because it's I mean, I haven't been punched a clock in so many years, but I know that that's the norm. So I would say if you're just starting out, you should have at least 20, 25 hours a week. I think that'd be ideal. Um, Less than that is probably going to be is probably something you shouldn't pursue at this time. I got you. Okay, so 20 to 25 hours a week extra. Okay, cool. John, this is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Making some extra cash. And so did they. Okay, so they said, yeah, we'll do it. Then they set up their LLC. Yep. And then, uh, John, you know what LLC is? Have you heard that term before? Yeah, I've heard it. It's like a, just a, is it a business? Like a 
form or something like that. Exactly. It's a yeah. form of a business, but yeah. it's like you got to register. Like, you know how you do a title that gets registered with the state? Like, you own this car? Yeah. Like, you can register a business with the state. Or no, you have to register a business with the state so they can control you is basically yeah. what you okay. do. You're basically like, you know, bending over. You're like, yeah, sure, you can have you can have full control over my business. Not really, but they definitely have full control over the financial aspect of your business when it comes to taxes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so they yeah. want to make sure you pay your taxes and you follow all the rules and regulations. Um, so LLC and a limited liability corporation. It stands for limited liability corporation. Um, so you know you have liability insurance on your car. Yeah. In case you hit someone or whatever, something happens, you can your insurance will pay that person uh, to fix their car. A limited liability company. If your business hurts someone, so God forbid. Uh, at this restaurant, someone were to slip and fall, um, and they want to try and sue me for everything I've got. Yeah, then they would have to sue the company. You got it. And the company limits the liability to me because only the company itself can be sued, not Amr Abdullah. Oh, okay. So you set up your LLC to make sure your repair and maintenance business doesn't get you screwed some way. And then what was step three? So what did you what did you do? How did you start getting them some repair and maintenance business? So after you after the business is set up, you get the insurance. And in this business, you need well, you have to have a general liability, which I'm sure you're familiar with. You mm -hmm. have to have errors and omissions, also called uh, professional liability. Mm. And then you may have to get workman's compensation insurance, depending upon the state that you live in mm. and uh, whether or not you have employees or independent contractors. So then once that's done, it's only a matter of applying to the right companies to get your, your very first contract. You can work with multiple companies. You can work with one company. You can work in one county. You can work in multiple counties. That part depends heavily on the temperament of the people that are involved. So if you can manage people well and delegate well and get really organized, you can handle more. If you are a person who freaks out and you're a control freak, you got to have control every single thing. You're going to have a hard time. Okay. I got you. Um, so you got to be able to be kind of chill sometimes. You do. Um, it's funny. My, a friend of mine, we were just talking about this on Facebook. He was saying that lazy people make the best entrepreneurs. <laughs> he said, um, he said, lazy people make the best entrepreneurs. And he said, people who are overthinkers, you know, they, um, they tend to struggle. Ah. And I knew exactly where he was going with that. Not lazy in the sense of not wanting to do shit, but lazy in the sense of, okay, let me think about this at a high level. Right. Who can I hire? How can I delegate? Right. How can I get out of doing more work and hire people to do um, stuff for me? Are you lazy? Would you consider yourself lazy, John? Oh yeah, completely lazy. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, so this might this might be for you, brother. Yeah, it might be. <laughs> yeah, having other but, people do stuff for me. If yeah. I could, if I could have somebody, you know, come in and wipe my ass for me, that'd that be, would that'd be working great. That, right? That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if that's where we were going with it, but <laughs> that's what John was going with it. Yeah, that's what John was going with it. If I could make that uh, profitable, <laughs> <laughs> that'd be great. You'd be happy to pay your LLC taxes for that, right? exactly. You know. <laughs> but I mean, I think it totally makes sense though, because I, even in my business, the people that I work with, I find that the more education a person has, the more degrees they have. The more time they spend in corporate America, they are the worst people. Not the worst in a sense. I feel like, you. Negative. But they're just hard to deal with because they don't believe anything. They're always analyzing stuff. They're scared to do anything without permission. It's just damn. It's I feel like you're speaking truth. Like, man, when I came out, I swear to you, I think I left the corporate world partly because I started to notice myself super anal yeah. about the smallest, dumbest shit. Yeah. And I'm like, how have I become such a perfectionist with all this? That was not what got me here, by the way. Yeah. Me being like, you know, a little more creative. Uh, you know, willing to fail, screw it up. Oh, I got to see, whatever. Let's try better next time. Uh, uh, watching my dad, God bless his soul. May he rest in peace. Watching him just like every day, wake up and just go be an entrepreneur. Like like that was what got me where, where I am today. Uh, but then after 10 years in the corporate world where they put so many rules, regulations, boxes, guidelines, hole punchers, I don't know. They put all sorts of shit all over you. Yeah. You just start, I, th I think I, it just transformed me in a way where it's like, can't do this, can't do that. The answer's no, the answer's no, the answer's no. It's like, damn, that brainwashing is not healthy. And so I feel like I've been reversing that for the last decade of starting to say yes more. 
I think it's yeah. probably one of the reasons I went to comedy because the rule of number one in comedy is yes. Say yes. Yes. Yeah. John wants to have a business that wipes his ass for him. Yes. yes. We'll get those taxes yeah. paid, baby. Mm. Yes. Get those get those taxes paid on Wipe John Dolder's ass, LLC. You know? So you just got to say yes, yeah. yes, yes. And that was like the medicine for me when it yeah. came to getting out of the corporate world and, and brainwashing myself to a, a better place. I think that that is such an accurate assessment. Um, so I think the 10 year mark, if I'm, if I think about this logically, I think the 10 year mark is probably kind of the make or break point. And I think the after 10 years, I think it gets virtually impossible to kind of reverse that. And I say that because one of the most common emails or inboxes or phone calls I receive are for people who have been in corporate or been at a job for 20, 30 years. So they're like, 45, 55 years old. Damn. And they're like, I want to do something different. And they don't have. <laughs> You're like, clue. too late, sucker. No, I don't. I don't say that. But it's like they don't know. They don't. They don't know what they like. They don't mm. know what they don't like. They don't Damn. know. They, they know nothing other than getting up and going to work. Right. That's a scary spot to be in. So every day I'm like, holy shit, let me never get in that, you know, find myself in that situation because. It's hard to get out of. I mean, I got to tell you, kind of- I, I, as much as I, com- I completely agree with everything you just said, full agreement. And I have this place, a compassionate place in my heart for, for those people. Cause guess what? It's also very easy. It's very comfortable. So the people who are emailing you, I think are on the edge of like, yo, should I go out of my comfort zone or not? You know? And I, I think that it might be tricky for them in year 20 or year 25 to be doing something like that because they've gotten so used to that comfortable lifestyle. I mean, there's so much that has to get that. There's so much training, almost like mental training that would have to happen for them to become comfortable with, um, you know, being more flex. I think the word is flexible. It's, it's, yeah. it's a little harder to be flexible when the corporate world trains you to think a certain way. Yeah. You're absolutely right about that. So, so, so how, how many years were these people that reached out to you? How many years were they in the corporate world? Uh, the most was 35. So a guy reached out to me. He actually was working in a government job in Alaska, believe it or not. Damn. And it was a great position. Like he, you know, was definitely well paid. But he just, and then a lot of times they're technologically, you know, deficient too. So that's the other issue. It's oh, like, man. they can't use a computer. Oh, they no. don't know about anything. And it's just like, they're bigger dinosaurs I don't know than you. Where to begin. Yeah, I don't know where to start. So, man. Um, uh, but what about the couple that made the 248000 Were they in the corporate world for a long time? Um, no, the, well, the wife was never in corporate. The husband, he had been in his position about 10 years or so. Okay. Like similar to you. So he okay. was, uh, he was ready. He, he kind of was at the right mix of, you know, not too long in corporate, but enough to have, have some money available to, to kind of branch out. He was at a really good spot. How did he, so, okay. So they, they, you hook them up, they get their insurance. Uh, yep. what does insurance cost for like setting up this kind of LLC? So what is general liability? Like I pay four grand a year. Is that what it is kind of for yeah. you? It is so you pay four grand for just general liability. Mm-hmm. That's the only policy you have. I believe so. Is that for multiple businesses though? No, just one. Wow. Okay. It, well, maybe the restaurant business is considered higher risk. So oh, this probably. Is, con- is considered higher higher risk. Um, so a policy may run you actually about three to four thousand, but that's for general liability and for errors and omissions too. Gotcha. Okay. So that's either three to four grand a year insurance. All right. They get set up with their insurance. How did, how long was it before they got, like, how did you then connect them to the right people or the right companies? Yeah. 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 So I know all the companies already just from experience and um, talking to my colleagues in the industry and of course doing research online. And there's only about a handful of ones that are national that Mm. will, that allow you to, that pay the best and allow you to kind of do the work and still hire people and make a decent profit. So at that point, I just told them, okay, here's the companies that we need to work with. Here's what I want you to put on these applications. Here's what you have to say in order to, you know, to get them to select you as um, to be on their team, because there's lots of companies that want to get in and, and get these types of contracts, but they're not in a position to do so. So you kind of coach them through yeah. how to fill out the applications, what to say, how to answer the questions, all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff yeah. in a way where those companies who issue these contracts would say, yep, we want to do business with you. All right. How long was it before they got their first contract after doing that? 
Um, they it took them about 90 days. I would say 90 days is average. Mm. I do have some people who do it significantly faster. And then I have others, usually my folks in corporate that are like too busy working or too scared. And they might it might take them, you know, nine months or a year. But that's because they they take forever to actually get started. Though, uh, as well. I got you. OK, OK, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. And then uh, so 90 days. And what was their first contract like? Was it just, you know, go fix this staircase and we'll pay you two thousand dollars? Uh, it depends. So there's lots of, you know, a lot of just think about, you know, Chicago, a little bit outside of Hyde Park. Right. So Hyde Park is great. And then you go a few blocks uh, south or a few blocks, you know, east yep. or west of the neighborhood changes. So think about how those properties look. You know, maybe the trees are overgrown. Maybe the grass is three mm. feet high. Maybe the snow needs to be shoveled. Maybe somebody. True story. One uh, property that we were assigned to, the people left the property voluntarily. But I guess they were pissed off about having to leave. And they left the water running in all the, like the sink, the bathtub, everywhere in the property in the dead of winter. So the entire oh. house basically froze. I've never seen anything like it to this day. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Someone like plugged up the tub. They plugged up the sinks. They probably plugged up the drains. I don't know. They probably shoved some stuff down there. And then they just turned it all on. And they're they like, the water. Yeah. that's like the exact opposite of like, you know, let's burn this bitch down. That's the exact opposite, <laughs> but it achieves the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. They caused a significant amount of damage to the property. Oh, hell so. yeah. They did. That, dude, that's where the, the, the movie Frozen, that's where they got the idea from that family probably. <laughs> that was the first thing I thought when I saw it in real. I was like, oh, wow, this looks like a scene from Frozen. And so oddly enough- Oh, did you go see the, the house, by the way? Yeah. I, sorry. Do I you see that one because that was, you know, not too far from where I lived at. Okay. Um, so you do run into some situations, though. You find out that, I don't know, I didn't know hoarding was as common as it is, for example. Um, I see hoarding, you know, you see the shows on TV, you're like, oh, that's weird, that's crazy, ha, ha, ha. It's a lot more common than you might think. <laughs> Wait, what's the, worst, what is the, what's the worst hoarding situation? Wait, now this is after they leave the property, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so what's yeah. the worst hoarding situation you saw? Uh, it was a house. It was actually in uh, one of the suburbs of Chicago. I forget which suburb it was. But no, it was in Oak Lawn. I remember. It oh, was in snap. Oak Lawn. And that might have been my house I grew up in because I'm a horror. <laughs> I, I don't know if this was yours. It was an elderly <laughs> guy. And he, you know how you, the, you fill up the garbage and you take it out to the dumpster and you yep. do this every day, every couple of days. He never took it outside. So all the trash in the garbage was in the house. And all the mail that he'd ever received was in the house. All the newspapers, like it was insane. I've no. never seen anything like it. Yeah. Was the yeah. dude still there? No, no, no. He, no, no, no. He had short. They, he was actually evicted from that property. That was an eviction. Hell yeah, he was evicted. Damn. Yeah. Wow. So what? So you had you hired a crew to do that? Yeah. So then you got to go in and clean out the property, take all the stuff out, take it to the dump. Um, which is great for us. It's profitable for us. But it just, you know, that was it was interesting to see somebody living in those conditions. Um, how how do you terrible. how do you decide what to charge for something like that? So good question. Sometimes the fees are set by the bank. They'll say, oh, we pay this for this amount. And in that instance, you could either say, OK, I can do it or I can't get it done. Mm. And then other times you have to come up with your own pricing. And I use bidding software for that. So there's plenty of bidding programs out there. There's the two that are my favorite. So I go in there, type in what needs to be done, and then it spits out numbers for what it should cost based on the zip code where you live. Mm. Gotcha. And then when it spits out a number of like, let's call it, so that job, what did that job spit out? What did, what did... Um, so the one with the hoarders, that was about $4,000 to get that property done. And it took about four days, which is pretty good. That's pretty so good. So we were happy with that. And then actually another property in Chicago was a four unit. That was the most that we'd ever done in a property. And that was like $6,500 to take out all the debris. It was like 400 cubic yards worth of trash out of that property. Wow. And then what about the frozen house? What did you charge for that? The frozen house ended up being seven thousand dollars to saw the saw out all the ice in the property, take out all the damaged drywall, take out the debris. Um, yeah, that was a pretty. What good. The How do you thaw a house? Like you just walk around with a bunch of like blow dryers? Like what the fuck? What does that mean? No, there's industrial sized um, heaters that you get that you can either buy or rent from Home Depot. <laughs> And you plug it in and you sit there all day for hours until it thaws. 
Oh yeah. man, I would just go to White Castle and get some food and hang out. <laughs> That's crazy. Do you ever yeah. do any of this work yourself, like just for the fun of it? No, I can't do anything. All I do is take <laughs> pictures, look cute, uh, <laughs> write checks. Um, check invoices. Yeah, that's all I do. I don't need to dance. I make money moves. You're Danielle Pierce. You're the Cardi B of uh, wealth of real estate. I, I don't know about all that. <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. John, do you want to do this job? Do this job. What do you think? Write checks and write checks. Tell people to un to thaw houses. Thaw houses. Yeah, like plug in that heater. <laughs> Slide down the stairs like it's a. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. The problem is you got to get up there. I don't know how you get up there. All yeah, closed. that's true. Did you, did you? So you went and saw this house, right? Yes, I did see that one. Was it like? Was it literally like the whole house frozen, or was it just parts of the house? Mm -mm. No, they did. They left water on the second floor, first floor. They even turned on the, all the faucets in the basement, so everything <laughs> was was uh, iced out. That's so you was. literally walked up I to the front door to a block of ice. Yeah. Well, you could see the ice coming from the. Um, from the, the, what is it called? Like, not the door jam, but the bottom of the door. Like, there was, like, ice. Seeping ice out? Was coming out? Yeah. This is totally like the movie Frozen. John, have you kid. seen the little ch children's movie Frozen? Yeah, I've seen it. You have? I was going to say, dude, because I have a kid. I've seen it 8,000 times. Of course. I'm surprised. <laughs> what are you doing watching it? What? I was in school. Like, they just put it on because they would just. Okay, put... Danielle, you got to remember. John is, like, 22? Yeah, 22, 23. 23? Yeah, 23. 23. So this is like what four or five years ago in school? Yeah, yeah, that's about right. Yeah, high school. Yeah, wow. high school. They made your senior class watch Frozen. It was like a, it was an art class or something. You just put, <laughs> like we weren't allowed to watch anything good. It was like that or October Sky. You know, it was no either idea, watch I... October. It's like a, it's a movie about these kids wow. that like get into making rockets or something in some mining town. Oh. And everyone's like that sounds know, a lot less tame than frozen yeah, they're like you they don't want you we don't want you flying rockets we want you getting black lung like <laughs> your papa and grandpappy miners yeah. uh sounds like you've watched both ad nauseum, yeah. <laughs> ad nauseum. <laughs> all right so the frozen house all right so uh so wait so okay let's go back so how did this yeah. couple make a quarter of a million dollars in one you said one year right yeah one year how did they was it did they just like, were they just taking, uh, getting contracts left and right from these banks or did they jump into the investing business and start flipping? So they weren't, it was one contract and they weren't flipping the properties either. So you got to think about all the properties in a specific zip code that need to be serviced. Um, and they were doing it pretty much on a full-time basis, um, even though the husband um, had his job at uh, downtown Chicago working in audit. So they just took on a lot of work. And then some things pay significantly more. Like you make most of your money doing the trash outs. So a trash out, you know, if you do two trash outs a week, you know, that's anywhere from, I want on average about fifteen to $1,800 per, per trash out. Mm -hmm. You do two of those a week, you're already at $3,600 for the week right there. And wow. then you just kind of multiply that out for the year. Right. So yeah, that's how they 3,600 times 52 is going to be 170 grand. Yeah. So right there, oh, that's well, you're good. Yeah, I oh, that's all I did on Wall Street. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do the math in my head quickly. All right, so all right, but now that that hundred seventy grand or whatever, that thirty six hundred a week, that's not all profit. You got to pay the the contractor, right? Yes, yes. What's what's the typical uh, profit margin in your experience? So I'd like to see mine at about forty percent. Um, mm. that makes me happy. 40 percent. Um, and even it, sometimes it sounds it sounds low. But I look at other industries like I don't know owning a grocery store, and you know they have you know pretty low. They're known for having pretty low profit margins. Yep. So I like to see 35, 40 percent. I think that's great, especially if you're you know managing it remotely and you're not chilling at home, but you're doing like I do everything from my computer. Um, mm -hmm. If I have a Wi-Fi connection, I can do whatever I need to do pretty much wherever I'm at. Your so office is wherever you need to be. It is, and you do it nationally all over the country. Well, no, not anymore. I I only work. I have one zip code in Chicago I still cover, and I have two in Texas that I cover. You could do it all over if you wanted to, but I mean, who needs that kind of stress in their life? I don't. Meaning, meaning, <laughs> meaning, meaning, you now have to um, manage different crews of human beings, contract contractors. Do you got to manage the, the hard? I would imagine the hardest part of this job is the contract is managing the contractors. Would you, you would, would, would you agree right. with that? I would <laughs> yeah, imagine absolutely. right. Okay. 
my imagination yes. is working. Yes. Yes. Uh, so what? What? So tell us, like, what, what's what's some of the what's some of the experiences with that? Like, what's what's the what's the best part? What's the worst part? I mean, I can uh, imagine the worst part in a lot of ways. Have you ever gotten any like threats? Did you ever get into like fisticuffs, like fighting them? Don't make I me come down to that frozen house. Um. Let's see. So evictions are typically hostile situations, uh, especially in Chicago. Um. So we've had situations where my team has had. Guns pulled on them by people who were being evicted um, or threatened by people being evicted. The police are, you know, are often involved when, you know, neighbors see us doing work on a property and they're like, oh, they're doing stuff at a property. We don't know what's going on. Let's call 911. So there, there's a lot of police interaction. I would typically say about maybe once or twice a month, the police are involved in some capacity. It usually, I mean, actually, it's always they come and they leave. But I do tell my contractors like, hey. Dude, if you got a warrant, you can lie to me about it, but I'm just letting you know the police will probably be around at one of these properties because the neighbors are going to call them. And so I want you to just be prepared for that. Oh, so that's snap. how I spin it up front. Yeah. Um, other issues with contractors. Have you ever had any of your contractors arrested? No, no. Okay, no, good. No. Um, other issues with contractors showing up to work on time, showing up to work uh, at all, showing up to work high, showing up to work drunk. Um, but you're remote. So how do you know if they're high or drunk? Um, well, this was, so in the first year, first two years, I actually, you know, provided the trucks and the trailers and everything and kind of, you know, I thought that it would be ideal to give them everything they needed to do the work mm. and then let them go out into the field. And that was a disaster because people, they just take better care of, you know, their shit than they do yours. Yeah. So they would come back and stuff would be missing, stuff would be stolen, stuff would be broken. Um the list goes on. Damn. Okay. Okay. And so have you, do you have to constantly like, I mean, these independent contractors sometimes can be painful. Like they, they say they're going to show up, but they don't show up. Right. I have that problem sometimes in, in this business. Um, do you, do you, uh, have that problem sometimes or have you arrived at a place where you got loyal people and you, you know, where, where are you in that? Cycle? I have three loyal people. After, you know, six going into seven years, there's only three, but they do a lot of work by themselves and they're, and they're very consistent. As far as outside of that, it's a lot of rotation just because they they work and I think things are going well, but then they'll fall off the face of the earth and then the cycle kind of repeats itself. I mean, I just think it's a transient business and um, it's part of the territory. Come in, Pancho. It's okay. Come in. <laughs> I'll taste it. Yeah. My, my, my uh, chef wants me to try something. Yeah. Cauliflower couscous? He's making a couscous out of cauliflower. Somebody doing keto? It's good. I, I think it needs maybe... No, it's good. It's good. Thank you. Um, that goes with our lamb chops, in case anyone's wondering. $30 on the menu. No, I was saying somebody doing keto. Is that why it's uh, cauliflower couscous? Oh, you know what? Yeah, I mean... Customers are all over it because it's like, uh, you know, they, 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 people want less carbs. So couscous right. or rice or potatoes. So my chef, his genius, he's like, yo, let's make them couscous, but out of cauliflower. It's a vegetable. It's healthier, digested yeah. easier. I'm like, that's gangster. Let's do it, baby. And so it's been yeah. a hit. It's been a big hit. Yeah. And so he was making it and he was testing. T I've got to give like the yay or nay on everything. Yeah. So I'm like, yep, go for it. Yeah. That tastes good. Have you ever been wrong? <laughs> Uh, I tell you what. So we relaunched a new menu recently. Okay. Customers are looking at me sometimes, Kaka. They're like, "What did you do to the old menu? I want the old menu back." WTF? I'm like, "Damn." They're like, "Give me my shawarma back." I'm like, "I'm like, yo, it wasn't the best seller. Like, why do you, you know, try yeah. try this other amazing stuff that we have now? You know." Yeah. Oftentimes they're like, "No, we we people. Some people don't like change. They get used to Most something. Most people don't like change, right?" And so they get used to something they don't want it, you know. Um, but this new chef we have is really killer. He's, he's get, making yeah. delicious food. It's healthy. It's tasty. It looks beautiful. He's got such an artistic touch to his. Uh, he's got like finesse. You know, when someone's got finesse and style. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about mm -hmm. this guy. He's got finesse and style. So I love what's coming out the kitchen. It's just going to be massaging the customers to be patient with us as we yeah. make it make it better. Um, but yeah, whoever's listening, come out. High Park, Baby Cedars. We, we'd love to have you. All right, back, yes. back, back to this business. I'm so excited about this. I'm thinking yes. to myself, like, yo, John, should we get into this? Get into what? 
<laughs> the hell's wrong with you, man? Where you been the last hour? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that we, thing. Should we get into doing this business? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That'd be cool, right? Um, all right, so, so you do have to rotate a lot of times. Where do you find your new contractors from? I run ads on Indeed, primarily. Um, so I used to use Craigslist more, but Craigslist has just been overrun by bots and crazy people the last, I don't know, four years. So right. primarily on Indeed.com is where I, I recruit or word of mouth. Did you say Indeed.com? Yeah. Uh-huh. I-N-D-E-E-D.com. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty good, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you say, you sound like you've never heard of Indeed. I can tell you've been out of the workforce a very long time. Oh, yeah. I, I know I know Fiverr and I, I know Upwork, but I never heard of Indeed. Really? Yeah. That is so crazy. That's like the number one job search engine. But really? you don't need a job, so you wouldn't know. Yeah. It's like, is it, I mean, it's not like Monster.com, is it? It is. Oh. It's the, replace, it's the replacement of Monster.com. Wow. I mean, I always picture like LinkedIn is kind of the new Monster.com, but maybe I'm mistaken. Yeah, well, for stuffy corporate jobs, yeah. But oh, outside of that, oh, I got you. This is for like more uh, uh, contractor type of jobs. Yes, I mean there's other jobs there too. But if I'm looking for a general, uh, general contractors, handyman, handyman, I go to Indeed. All right, cool. All right, so um, this is amazing. Like I, I'm, su- I'm super interested in doing something like this. I, I'd love this. I, I think people should totally pay attention. So, um, all right, so. But let's plug you real quick and then we'll keep going. So if people yes. wanted to work with you or learn from you, get coached by you to become more real estate savvy and become a repair and maintenance person, where, how do they reach? How do they find you, Danielle? So the primary way is my website, which is DaniellePierce.com. How genius is that? And then the genius. other primary method would be my YouTube channel, which is super dope. My YouTube channel is kind of my, my give back I, my free stuff, I, you know, community empowerment stuff is where I, I do a lot of, um, provide a lot of that content. So mm-hmm. I do that on my YouTube channel. Nice. And what, 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 how do they find your YouTube channel? What is it called? What would they search? Danielle Pierce. Oh, really? Did they, right? Yeah, yeah. YouTube? Danielle yeah. Pierce. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Okay, mm-hmm. great. And they'll, I mean, basically all the stuff we're talking about here, they can probably learn about on there additionally, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I'm all very, right. very consistent. Do, John, if you if you wanted to do this, do you feel like you got honestly? Do you feel like you had a, some sense of how you would go about doing this? Go about uh, like managing real estate. Or yeah, beca- exactly. Becoming like a repair and maintenance person for these foreclosed homes. Foreclosed homes. God, how, how would I go about it? I don't. I don't think he's been paying attention, Daniel. I'm not gonna lie. I was just distracted by that couscous. <laughs> That's honestly. Uh, no, so 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 we we hook up with Danielle. Yeah. We yes. would basically get an LLC open. Yeah. Buy some insurance. Yeah, insurance. And start looking for contracts yeah. applying yeah. to companies who would yeah. tell you, hey, there's a whole bunch of debris inside this house. Get a profile on Indeed. <laughs> Put a profile up on Indeed. Find the contractor. Tell him, hey, I'll pay you. I'm gonna get paid two grand. I'll pay you. 800 bucks to go to this house and clean it all out. He or she says, yup, done. You cut the check for 800, keep yourself 1200. Boom. You made some money. Does that sound right? Sounds That's good. literally it. What do you think, John? That's you want to do that? Yeah, it seems, it seems it. pretty good. It seems easy enough. Yeah. Right? Uh, all right. What you don't get into flipping, you don't get into buying the foreclosed homes. You don't, but you say you do tax lien investing. So you do yes. actually put capital at risk, right? Yes. What is that? So the tax lien investing is totally separate. And let me address one other thing about the bank on the foreclosed properties. You can't actually buy those properties. You're for you're forbidden from bidding on them. So it's similar to how if you ever look at um, MLS listings for, let's say, Bank of America or Wells Fargo and the fine print, they clear they say if you have any relationship with Bank of America vendor, supplier, contractor, blah, yada, 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 you're not eligible to bid on those properties. It's a conflict mm. of interest. So, because people always ask like, oh, can I buy them? It's like, well, you can't. Now, do people try to do it? Yeah, people try anything, mm. but technically you're not supposed to do that. I got you. Okay. That's a yeah. good point. That's a good point. Okay. All right. So what about the tax lien investing? How does that work? And do, are you active in that? Where do you make more money? Tax lien investing or repair and maintenance? I make most of my money doing the repair and maintenance work, but tax lien investing, uh, I'm super excited about because it is the for me the best way to acquire properties. Um, it varies wildly though, depending upon where you live. So Illinois, for example, has a very long redemption period. 
and just a, a kind of a complicated process to, to get these types of properties that are delinquent in property taxes. Um, other places like, you know, 30, 45 minutes away in Indiana, you know, the, the starting prices are $500 for some of the auctions that take place in Indiana. So it just, it, it, you have to pick the right location to make it happen. Okay, wait, wait. So let's go a little slower here. So we're talking about people who, there are human beings out there in the world who own yes. property. Yes. And they decided to stop paying their property taxes. They're delinquent on their property taxes. Instead of paying right. their 2000 3000 5000 a year, they just stop completely. Yes. Then I presume the, the government takes over that property? The local government uh, puts the property up for auction. Um, oh, really? Yeah. And so the sales, you know, it just depends on where you live. So Illinois has a, a, a annual sale and a scavenger sale, which is done every other year. Um, Indiana does sales. There's about, well, I'm talking about Lake County in Indiana has uh, three per year that they do. But other counties, you know, I'm in Texas now. Texas does a sale every month. It's mm. called Super Tuesday. Mm. And so does Georgia. So mm. it just depends on where you live. But I know in Indiana, I like Indiana a lot. And it's popular because the starting bid for the March auction, which is coming up, uh, they haven't announced the exact date, but it'll be the middle of March. The starting bid will be $500. So you can, you know, potentially get a bid for $500. It's going to need work. It's going to be in the hood, but it'll be $500. You'll own, yeah, you'll own an actual property for $500. Yeah, so there's a and there's there's a redemption period too. Let me mention that as well. But the redemption period for that sale that is coming up in March is only 120 days. So you wait out that four month period. Owner doesn't have the money. Owner can't pay the property taxes. Owner can't pay the penalties and fines, etc. Then you hire an attorney to uh, kind of convert that property into an actual deed, and then it's your property. So from start to finish, on average, it takes about seven months. In Indiana, early, Indiana. In Indiana. Much longer yeah. in Illinois. So seven months. And then once, yeah, Illinois is uh, two and a half years wow. uh, for that same process. Yeah. Yeah. I've had a friend on named Faisal El Khatib. He's been on before. He does a lot of this work and he told me it's a two plus year process on some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Illinois okay. Is and so what is the process like in Texas? How many months? Texas is an interesting state as well. So Texas actually only sells deeds and not tax liens. So technically, you get the deed, right? When Once you bid on the property, you're the winning bidder. Um, it's called a redeemable deed because the owner can still come back and say, oh, I got all the money now. I'm going to pay you know, all the money back that I owe. But the thing about Texas, though, is that the interest is 25% Ooh. and it's per year. Ooh. So you spend, let's say you spend $100,000 on a deed and if the owner wants that property back, it's a hundred plus your attorney's fees, plus you know, twenty five thousand dollars, which represents your interest, plus any improvements you've made. So it gets very, very uh cost prohibitive for the owner to actually ever redeem the property. And right. if it's a property that's non homestead, then it's only six months. So Okay. It's a sweet deal. That's pretty good. So where do you do most of your tax liens? In Indiana or in Texas? Indiana and also Tennessee, which we didn't talk about, but uh I like Tennessee because again it's affordable. Um, and it's actually a, a strong rental market. I'm thinking about the Memphis area, but I'm I'm more so looking now to actively build a portfolio of rentals as opposed to flipping. Flipping, it, you know, is cool. I've done it a couple of times. Flipping is mad stressful, though, and I don't need that stress in my life. Right. right. Now. <laughs> yeah. You, you started out with that. So you're a woman who's anti-stress. It's smart. That is going to give you long life. Yes. Good for you. All right. So, um. Tell us about your best, most amazing tax lien story that you've had an experience with, either you or someone you've coached. Mm, someone I coached acquired nine winning tax lien bids in Indiana for, I think it was $8,000. Wow. So less than $1,000 uh, a lien, a tax mm -hmm. a property. Yeah. I've okay. gotten four at a time, which cost me about... Three. And this is not including attorney's fees. Let me say that, too, for people who are like, oh, what is she talking about? Is this a real thing? It's not. Mm -hmm. Attorney's fees will run you between 800 to 1000 per property. Okay. So it's not including that, which you don't have to have an attorney. I, however, strongly recommend that you do get one unless you're a tax lien specialist already, which mm -hmm. obviously you probably won't be. Mm -hmm. um, and I've gotten four properties at a time. I think I, I paid three thousand dollars for that. Indiana? I didn't end up hosting. Yeah, and indeed, I just ended up wholesaling those properties because I didn't want to do all the rehab for all four. Yeah. But so the thing you have to think about is just what your exit strategy is and how much money do you have. 
you don't have that much money, flipping is probably not going to be the best option for you. So you're probably going to be looking to wholesale. But if you do have money, um, you can do what some investors do and they spend six figures for properties mm -hmm. and then they turn around and put them right back on the market for like I saw one guy bought a property for 172 mm -hmm. and it was worth 285. So if you have that kind of money, you can make those kind of moves. He, well, he pay, did he pay 172? Yeah, he paid one seventy two. You pay the did money. He put in, did he put any money into it then? Uh, that property, I I looked at that property and it it needed nothing. It was oh. about eight years old. Yeah. Oh wow! So he bid one seventy two and then he made a hundred grand. Yes. Wow. So the ones you wholesaled uh, in Indiana, the four properties, what yeah. did you were you able to turn around and sell those quickly? Uh, yeah, it took me like less than thirty days. I oh, mean, wow. I just sold. Yeah, because I got it so cheap, so I sold it cheap. And then yep. anytime you can sell a whole property for like, you know, a few thousand bucks, people are going to jump on it because people need places to live, especially with the affordable housing prices everywhere in this country. You know, people are being literally priced out of, um, you know, neighborhoods, right. even people who have jobs. So that people work every day but can't afford to buy a place or rent a place where they live. So, yeah. Wow. OK, so give us an example of some of those properties, the four that you sold. So you yeah. bought them each for about a thousand, maybe two thousand with attorney's fees. Were you able to sell them for like five each? I sold them for five thousand dollars each. Oh yeah. well, you did and okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so you pick a. You must think the same way that I do because the answer because most people are not able to grasp like what I'm saying as quickly and kind of follow the train of thought. But yeah, you got you, it. <laughs> maybe because I, when I worked at the bank, I did a lot of. I had to think. I had to understand how real estate works in yeah. order to do the trades that are hedging the real estate transactions. So like, I, it was important for me to understand that. And, and I've just got friends who've talked about real estate quite a bit and I've understood yeah. it. But I haven't, I, I do own myself a property, an investment property, but not, I didn't acquire it the way you did. I acquired it through a short sale. Um, so right uh, before foreclosure. And so I got a good deal on that. And so I've had to think about real estate from that perspective. But what you're doing, man, you're, I mean, You've done a bunch of homework and you figured out a lot of stuff. I like that. And I, I feel like if people were just to listen to your coaching, they, they'd get really good at real estate pretty quick. Yeah, I'm consistent. So I'm not the person who does like real estate and most of marketing and travel. Like I just stick with what I know because I feel like if you're consistent with whatever your thing is, that you'll ultimately be successful. And people will, when they think of real estate, they think of me, as opposed to mm. when you confuse your customers and you do a bunch of different shit. They're like, well, I don't know what this person does. So I'm not going to ever spend money with them because they, I don't know what they do. Right. So I'm very consistent. I've only always ever done real estate. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, cool. Cool. All right. So in the tax lien world, uh, you make a little bit less money yes. than, than the repair and maintenance, but, but it's nice that you, when you do make money, it you kind of make a chunkier amount of money because yes. you'll buy something for a thousand and sell it for more. Yeah, like five thousand. Yep, and I'm like I said, I'm building my 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 rental portfolio. So I have a, a couple properties in Tennessee that I'm gonna I have to rehab uh, and rent those out. You can see I'm not excited about doing a rehab, yeah. but I am excited about you know establishing that monthly residual income because I think I mean anytime you can build that, that's where it's at. I presume you're not excited because there's more stress in the rehab. Is that right? Yeah, I got to go there. So I got to go there to kind of uh, open and pick the contractors, make sure they show up, make sure they don't steal my shit. You know what I mean? Like the usual. <laughs> what, 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 steal your shit? What do you, you, I thought you're not going to give them the trailers and the tools. No, I mean, so when I mean, like if, they, if when you buy the materials and I guess I'm thinking about a situation I had a couple uh, years ago, um, I fired the first crew and brought on another crew. The first crew came back to the property and stole the stuff that I bought. Um, before the second crew could get there. And Damn. so, yeah. That's great. I mean, that, what you need is a quick and dirty way to like quickly figure out who is the reliable contractor and who isn't. If there was a system to like a process for that, that's yeah. like, that's a big part of this job. I feel like is managing these contractors. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, but nobody I know has figured it out. Even people who've been in real estate for 20 years, they're like, shit, I got nobody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's great. <laughs> I hope you become the Elon Musk of real estate. Man, that would be great. Figure out all yes. these processes and use AI to figure out which contractor's lying through his teeth. That'd be cool, right? Totally. Absolutely. 
Great. Well, Danielle, this has been amazing. I feel like I feel like I know exactly what I need to do if we were to totally get into repair maintenance or tax lien stuff. Uh, uh, I, I feel like I've got a good sense of of what I want to do. I mean, the first thing I when I get what I gather from the tax lien is stay the hell away from Illinois. Two and a half years. I mean, that's just like. Yeah, I mean, I think you do well. You start registered for the March sale in Indiana. I think if you started there and kind of you know expand it, because you could do, you don't have to you can stay out of Gary altogether. You can do like Hammond, Maryville, Sherville. There's some beautiful properties there. It's the mm. lakefront properties in Lake County, Indiana. They they border Lake Michigan. Really? And they're so much cheaper than yeah, absolutely. You can yeah. get them on tax lien. You can't. I mean, you're they're not going to be cheap, but no. you can get. Yeah. And how would you know how much to bid for something like that? So you would do that by assessing the market value up front. So I have, um, I, I kind of figure out a quick and dirty way to, to value properties. It doesn't really matter where they are. I have a certain formula that I use. And if I know the property is worth, let's say $100,000 and, and I'm guesstimating that repairs are going to be, I don't know, let's say 10, 20% because it doesn't look like it needs that much work. So I say, okay, it needs 20,000 in repairs. It's worth a hundred. That leaves me 80,000. How much do I want to, you know, spend to get this property? Mm. And what's my profit goal? So you figure out that number first and then you mm. bid on bid from there. I got you. Makes sense. All right. So let's say I jumped into a coaching relationship with you where I'd be like, I want to do some of this, but I need someone to kind of hold my hand the first year or two. Like, how do you, how, to the extent you're willing to share, how do you, how would the, what kind of relationship would you have with someone like me or a a client of yours who wants you to coach them for the first year of them doing this? So the, a year is a very long time and I've never coached anyone for that long. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I feel like if you, if you're consistent and you are coachable, um, the way that I do it now is I do eight weekly live group coaching sessions with either my tax lien people or my repair and maintenance people oh, nice. because I have it. I'm very streamlined in my approach. So there's not a lot of empowerment and rah-rah and, oh my gosh, let's do affirmations. It's more so like, <laughs> this is what we need to do. Here's the 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 game plan. And this is the date by when you need to get these things done. If you follow this, you'll be good. Mm. So if it takes me a year to teach anything, I feel like I'm either failing or the person that's not getting it. Right. So I do eight weeks. Outside of that, there's monthly options where we could still stay connected. But I mean, most most people are fine within the you know that that eight week time frame. You bring them in for eight weeks and then you kick them out. That's what it's basically an eight week boot camp. It is a boot camp, and I like boot camps. You seem like you'd be a good uh, sergeant. <laughs> Get down do and like give me it. twenty, Dolder. <laughs> uh, all right. So what does that cost? So the training is it's nineteen ninety seven for both of them. Twenty bucks? No, like one thousand nine hundred ninety seven. Oh, I was gonna say like that ain't right. <laughs> All right, so two grand for eight weeks. Oh, for yeah. both wait for both of them, you get the tax lien and you get the other one. Uh, uh it's per per course. Okay, per course, two grand. Yep. All right, two grand per course, two grand for the tax lien, two grand for the repair and maintenance. Yep. Eight eight weeks once a week. Yes. All right, so you think about it as like two hundred two hundred fifty dollars a cor a course. Oh, uh, sorry, a, a session, and then that two grand basically kicks you off into a world where you could start making 50, 100 grand a year right away. It does. It, it legitimately does. I have, so my reviews right now are at about 100 plus on Google, 100 on the course, another 100. I have about over 300 right now, um, five-star reviews mm. from different people around mm. the country. Mm. Um, and they're just like, some people say I'm a little blunt or a little, you know, too direct, but I mean, it, it's effective. And so I feel like you're paying for a result. And so Hell yeah. In this business, you, you want to, you <laughs> don't beat around the bush. Tell me how to make money. Get straight to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. Congrats, Danielle, man. I'm so proud of you. This is amazing, man. Amazing work you're doing. Like I, I never heard met, met or heard anyone doing this. This is amazing. Good for you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I got to get John Dola to hit you up. Maybe I'll hit you up too. Yeah, I'm going to send you the link for because I, I, I'd like for you to at least start and go see what the Indiana sale looks like. I think you'll think you'll fall in love and you'll have a new a new business that you'll add to your portfolio. I love that. Yeah, I'm thinking about lakefront properties right now. Like, imagine that if I got a good lakefront property. Um, cool, cool. So DaniellePierce.com, D-A-N-I-E-L-L-E, Pierce, P-I-E-R-C-E.com. Listeners, check her out. Real estate wealth strategist. Yes. Legit. She's going to help you guys make some, some wealth, man. I think this is yes. for real. And you're pretty funny. And you're cool. And you're <laughs> doing you. it. You've been in the corporate world and you're not doing the entrepreneur world. So you get both sides. So you can help some people who are on the corporate side, uh, 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 you know, wiggle themselves out of that. Yeah. As long as they're not 
20, 30 year corporate folks. So that's I, gonna I be have much a hard harder. time. Yeah. yeah. That's that's again stress, which Danielle loves. <laughs> right. Danielle, it's been a pleasure meeting you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Likewise. Yeah, thanks for coming on the show. Yes, sir. Looking forward. Peace out. All right. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. All right, peace.